Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another amazing webinar with Poseidon Animal Health. Last webinar, I mentioned we had record registrations. Well, tonight we've actually beaten the last webinar, which is fabulous because the team we've got presenting here tonight have got so much to share with you. So thank you for giving up your time. I know you're joining us from all over Australia, different time zones and New Zealand. We've even got people from the USA. So we are so excited to be here working with you tonight on an amazing webinar all about new horses. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I am Linda Goldspink Lord and I am the owner and founder of Poseidon Animal Health and I will be your host tonight. We are doing this webinar in collaboration with some amazing businesses. So a huge shout out to EQ Saddlery for their support. We have, I'll be introducing Nikita Stowers and Shelley Appleton in a moment. They're joining us from Varney and for... Sorry, Shelley, help me with it. <laughs> I said to Shelley before we start, I'll forget to say that. Tonight is a fabulous topic. It's all about new horses and it's very timely for me because I'll be sharing my journey with my new horse as we work through this webinar. I'm really confident by the end of tonight that you will have some amazing tips, but you'll have really great insight into why when we get a new horse, that they may change in the days and the weeks that follow from purchasing them. So we've got lots to get through. So let's get started. And I'm going to introduce our panel. So as I've mentioned, I'm Linda and I am very proud to have Dr. Shelley Appleton joining us. And Shelley has a lot of experience in understanding so much about horses, but the way they I guess they process things, their behaviour, and she also has an amazing background in human behaviour. So there's, there's lots to learn from Shelley tonight. And sorry, I should, probably should get you to say hello to the everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Then we have Dr Ethan Romas-Hill. For those of you who have been on our webinars before, you'll recognise Ethan, and he'll be adding input tonight around from a veterinary perspective and about some of the things we need to look out for when you buy a new horse. So welcome, Ethan. Linda, good to be here. I should mention, we've actually gone very high tech for this webinar. We're all in a studio together. So this is the first time we've all sat around a table. So we feel like we're having a bit of a chat. Um, but the cameras are on and you're all watching us. So hopefully we won't get too carried away and uh, forget that we've actually got the camera on. <laughs> and joining us is Nikita Stowers. And she's been a long-term um, equine nutritionist with Poseidon. And she brings such incredible knowledge around equine nutrition. So welcome, Nikita. As we always do, we have an amazing prize to give away at the end of the webinar. And this one is really valued quite high. So an incredible package where you've got products from Poseidon Animal Health, Digestive VM, EQ and Stress Paste, which is all about gut health. We have an hour nutrition coaching from Nikita. And for those of you who have done webinars with us before, you will hear me say that we've got to stop guessing. We can do better for our horses and nutrition is the foundation. So this is an incredible opportunity. We also have a voucher from EQ Saturday and there's always lots of things to buy in their stores. And then Shelley's got an amazing package that she's also offering, which is the complete reboot system. Shelley, do you want to quickly just give us a one minute explanation of yeah, what that sure involves? Can. So what that is, that's my complete training package, uh, which is the process that I use for which I call rebooting or rebuilding a horse's foundation, which solves a lot of issues. And wow. this is just one of the issues we're going to be talking about tonight. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. This is an incredible prize. Now, of course, if you aren't lucky enough to win this prize tonight, you can also purchase these products at a different time. So let's get started. What are we going to cover today? Lots. And as always, we will be taking questions as we go through the webinar. So if you have any questions, please send them through and our team will try and answer as many as they can. But if we can't get those all answered, like we've always done before, they'll be sent out to the panel who will then answer those and then we will then email those out as well. We do have some polls, so we'd love you to jump on and we'd like to know more about you and where are you from? You know, what are your challenges? What do you know about new horse syndrome? The more that we can understand what your needs are, the more we can meet them through education. And for those of you who have been long-term supporters of Poseidon Animal Health, you will know that we're not just about delivering evidence-based products. We're about giving you the best education possible. So to do that, we need to know what it is that you need to know about. So back to tonight's webinar, 
we're looking at what do we mean when we talk about new horse and new home syndrome? What does it actually mean and why is it important? Also about how do you spot those signs early? Buying a new horse is a massive, massive commitment, not just through money, but also your time, your love, your hope for the future. So how do you manage that transition? And the tips to manage the change is what I think you'll be really, really excited about because there's some really practical strategies that you can use. But before we get to that, we'll talk about the why. Why do these things happen? The impact of stress and the more that we work in this space of gut health and understanding horses, the more that we realise as horse owners, we completely underestimate the impact of stress on horses. And again, for those of you who've been with me before, you will hear me talk quite passionately about this in that we think horses, because they're calm and they're not showing any signs that they're not stressed, we've actually got that wrong. And I know Shelley will be taking us through lots of information about that. And then at the end, a case study, and that's the bit that I'm excited to share. It's about my beautiful new horse, Brave. Just to remind everybody that in the blink of an eye, everything has changed about our horses. So much has changed and we tend to forget that we've changed not only what we feed them but how they're housed, you know, the fact they don't have, you know, paddock mates anymore. Everything, everything has changed. So our horses are challenged all the time. And then on top of that, the impact of domestication is massive and that we are, we're feeding our horses to suit them, we're housing them to suit ourselves, we're doing everything that suits us but doesn't suit the need of the horses. So everything's changed for the horses. We've changed so much about them. So every day there's a challenge and then you get a new horse or they come to a new home and everything has changed for them, everything. And it's not just the little things, it's like... Their housing, the temperature, the pasture, their paddock mates, the routine, what you feed them, the it just goes on and on and on. And yet we expect them to cope with those changes and we expect this horse that we've gone and seen and we've trialled, we want them to be exactly the same and often they change and they'll turn into this fire-breathing dragon and you think, well, that's not the horse that I went and trialled, that's not the horse that I thought I'd bought But the reason is we haven't understood how much has changed for them and we expect them to cope, but there's so much to it. So I'm going to hand over to Shelley to take it from there. Yeah, that's a good place to hand it over to me because it's that whole change thing that people have to understand. So what I want to uh, inform people about is the root cause of the stress and why that actually occurs. Back in 2002, I met an amazing man in America called Kerry Thomas, and he's a herd dynamic specialist. He's the man that spent a good portion of his life just studying and observing wild mustangs. And he made some really interesting observations and some conclusions from that. And he points some things out. First of all, the horse did not evolve to live alone. It evolved to live in herds. Mm. And within herds, Horses but not only monitor their environment together, but they also regulate their stress and emotions. So changes in the environment very much trigger a horse. So if we just go to the next slide here. Whoops, it's going to go back. I went too far. So Kerry really summarises what a horse actually seeks because he was really blown away how you could have these herds of horses uh, that were surrounded by predators that were picking them off from time to time and these horses were completely most of the time completely relaxed like how the hell did that Mm. happen and it's funny because people think a horse is a stress and that's natural for them and they're reactive and stuff like that no that's when you take them out of how they've evolved how they've actually evolved and put them in a domesticated situation which is not how they've actually evolved Mm. Uh, they're evolved to do things together in this collective network So Kerry really nails it when he says, what does a horse actually seek? And I love this and I really want to quote him saying this. So what do horses seek? Horses actually seek harmony with their environment and contentment with their peers. And what that means, they need to feel safe in their environment and they need to get on with those other creatures that they have to interact with. They've got to get on with the other horses that they're with. Plus also we're one of the peers as well. And if there's some kind of conflict within there or they feel threatened by either their environment or the people, that causes them a great deal of stress 
The other important things about horses, they're not like us. They don't generalise. They don't walk into a, a, a new home and go, oh, a new home. They don't. It's completely and utterly different. So horses actually have to process their environment and that's important to understand. And there's this thing that, um, that Kerry talks about is herd dynamics. If you talk to me and mention a couple of years ago herd dynamics, I go, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. It's who's boss of the herd. No, it's not. It's way deeper than that. Um, a herd dynamic is, is also how a horse processes their environment. They don't see the world as we see it. Okay, and so for every time, they're, they're, they're evolved to really detect change in their environment because is that a rock or is that a tiger? Mm. They need to be able to be aware of any little change. They're not like us. They see things completely. Do they pick up movement more than us? Their eyesight, their hearing, everything slightly is actually quite different. So they process their environment. They're sensory animals. So information comes in through the environment, into their senses, and they've got to process and identify they're okay. All horses have within a herd have a different capability of being able to do that, different speeds, different, um, uh, you know, some are faster than others, et cetera. And it's these differences in how they process their environment is what knits them together. It's why they're a team effort. You've got a horse that's actually quite sensitive to the environment. You need them because they're like the trip alarm system. Mm. But you also need the horses that are better at it, that are better at like relaxing everyone down, going, we're cool, everyone. So <laughs> they need to walk. for this webinar. That's right. <laughs> that was so you. the yeah. sensitive horses are like trip alarm systems, yeah. but the, you know, the cool ones are the ones that let everyone relax and mm. eat and digest and sleep and chill because they're like, we're sweet. However, if those animals were by themselves in nature, the ones that are very sensitive would be too stressed and they wouldn't thrive. And the ones that are a bit more chilled would get picked off, but together they work mm. as one. So what happens out of that to understand is number one, you get, uh, you've got a, 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 an amazing animal that is very triggered by change in its environment because its whole system goes, am I okay, am I okay, I've got a process, got a process, got a process. And then you've got the next important things is horses vary in their abilities to be able to do that. So some are a lot more, uh, have a greater ability to cope with change than others. However, on saying that, horses can be nurtured in their abilities to do it from experiences they have in life. Um, so, so, so Shelley, important. just on that then, so you, you get a new horse. Think about my horse, Brave. Yeah. He would have had his own herd. Yeah. He would have known who's the calm one, who's yep. the stressor, what they need to do. So not only have you changed everything else, all of a sudden it's like I don't, I don't have those other herd members that I can rely on to keep me safe. That's right. So they've made all this network that you know their home, a horse's home, or where they've where they've been for a period of time. And look, a lot of times I've got to say this quickly. Sometimes they move to a new home and it's better. Okay, right. they yeah. were very stressed before. But you know the most typical thing that happens: they were home. It was familiar. They were mm. familiar. They were familiar with their peers. They were familiar with their environment and their routines. That was familiar. That was home. It's like when we when we go home to our homes, it's it's where you can like, you know put your comfy clothes on and chill out yeah. because it's home, okay, yeah. and you know where everything is. Like they say one of the most stressful things anyone can do is move home, yeah. <laughs> you know, just for us yeah. is to actually um, change and, and swap homes. Yeah. It's because everything's not in its place and things like that. Well, horses get more grossly affected mm. than we do mm. because of how they're programmed. They're programmed to really identify change. And so the root cause of stress and why I'm, I'm, I'm so – um, grateful that you guys have take this on to really promote this idea is that it's the root cause of the stress. It's the horse moving to a new environment and just getting swamped mm. with change, swamped and what that does to them, the pressure that puts under their sensory system and trying to work out, you know, am I in a threat, am I not? It's the equivalent of just say aliens, you know, came and plucked you out of your house and went and popped you on another planet and you were meant to be that alien that you just rocked up with that you don't know how they how they don't know how they communicate you don't know anything about the place you don't know anything about the customs nothing and you're meant to be that alien's best yeah. friend yeah and i and i know we'll cover this later but i guess there are some things we can't control we are still going to buy new horses oh, and absolutely. we'll do that and we can't bring the herd with them so i think it's really important to look at then what things can we control? Yeah, what things the, can we keep consistent? And that's the cool thing because yep. when you understand, because most people are oblivious to this, mm. they're completely oblivious of how that horse is actually wired. 
okay? Completely oblivious. So by knowing it and understanding this is what this horse is going to be going through, this mm. is the root cause, this is the trigger, this is what lights the match of stress, okay? And then that's why we've got Ethan and Keita and everyone on here talking about these things, that that fire that gets that can get lit, that's, that erupts that stress within the horse, it can have this cascading effect down. Mm. Mm. And that's where you get the people that are rocking up to me with their problem horse, mm. okay, that they might have even had for two years. They've never been able to get on with it mm. because of this chaos that happened when it was arrived. You know, people were oblivious, which is normal. But it's, it's not something I'm sure that people listening to this have not necessarily heard about what I've talked about um, and not understanding the impact that it has on horses. And it has a huge impact in terms of safety because I think about, you know, I've had children that have ridden horses, you buy a new horse and the horse then becomes unsafe. And so I think yes. this is this is yes. important for so That's many reasons. Yeah, it affects their behaviour. So yes. what happened? This stress, it impacts the horse on all these multiple levels. It gets The stress gets compounded. You get psychological and physiological um, problems that come about. That And what we see is the behaviour. Mm. And we don't understand that this is the root cause and then it's the stress has gone on to do this. Yeah. But the cool thing is, and what we're going to be talking about tonight, is all the things you can do about yeah. it. Because yeah. when you know it's going to happen, yeah. you can do all these things to absolutely manage it and minimise it so you can get a more successful yeah. transition into that new home. So I coined this term, I coined you home syndrome. I've also got new horse syndrome because people <laughs> go through something similar as yeah. well. And I've got a good argument for why I call it a syndrome because what I see is I see that. I see the people that are rocking up with a horse that they have had for a couple of years but they haven't got on with or they might have just got the horse or they've had this young horse, they've sent off to the breakers and it's come back and they've just struggled to get this partnership going or they're struggling with behavioural issues. So they're struggling to get on with it. So I call it new home syndrome because it's so predictable, okay? It can tie it all back. And some people might be sitting there and going, oh, my gosh, you know, I've had this horse for five years. This might be what's wrong with it. It's mm -hmm. like, yes, mm -hmm. it's because you've got chronic stress that's built up over time and, you've, and it hasn't been able to be rectified. But it can. That's yeah. the cool thing, mm -hmm. even if you're down the track. But anyway, why a syndrome? I say it as, as the word syndrome is a is used to describe a set of symptoms that consistently occur together. Okay, and they can be tied to certain factors, right? It, and sometimes it can be um, of known things. Sometimes it can be unknown, and it doesn't necessarily have to be connected to a disease. Okay, so new home syndrome. I coined that term because it's connected to a horse being placed. Um, in a new home where its entire world changes and this massive kind of experience happens to a horse which can cause stress, which then goes on and can cause psychological and physiological impacts. And Shelley, can I just add that into yeah. that as well, that we know we're not talking about gut bacteria today, but we do know the link between gut bacteria and a horse's behaviour and the yeah. whole link to the brain and oh, creating those calm. There's so it many all pathways. There's so many. And so we're going to touch yeah. on a few yeah. of the real main big yeah. ones we tonight. We could definitely do a yeah. whole session on we the could. gut brain axis. So. <laughs> we yes. could. We absolutely yes. could. Um, so, yeah, there's absolute strategies. So it's when you understand and you know what's going on and you know the ramifications, there are strategies galore, which is very cool. Um, so we're going to go through uh, a number of them, a real number of the key ones for everyone. So first of all, it's like managing, um, you know, how do we help horses process this new environment mm. that's really triggering that no one understands? Okay, then how to manage sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation is massive. It's so insidious. I'll talk more about it in a minute. Um, muscular tension from holding that tension and mm -hmm. stress. Big problem has ramifications down the track. Then we've also got um, additional um, additional stresses, which is us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. that's us. Um, <laughs> and then we've got to manage diet. Massive, yes. massive impact. And then, um, you know, you've got to create a partnership with a horse. You can't outsource your relationship and your partnership with a horse to somebody else. It's like you just can't get someone to give you a pre-made husband, wife, girlfriend, <laughs> boyfriend, best friend. You know, yeah. You've got to make yeah. them yourself. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, so just some tips for uh, processing, um, processing your environments. What can you do, okay? So what can you do? Management. First of all, that horse rocks up. Don't go stick it in the paddock by the freeway, <laughs> you know. See if you can put it when it's – you want to put it in the in, – if you can, in a, in a place that is a bit more calm. It's not so hectic, not so crazy. Uh, it's not a good idea to go chuck it in with your other horses. Mm-hmm. It's really good to separate them mm-hmm. for a while. I had a client do a most beautiful uh, transition of her new young horse into her herd. Uh, she just kept it separated for a couple of weeks and then it was the big day where she put them in together and it was nothing. She oh. was there with the camera <laughs> and the vet on the just yep. to give them a call. But she just took a picture because they did absolutely nothing. And wow, it's like that's, that's because fabulous. she managed yes. that transition yeah. beautifully. Mm. Also their housing, take note of that. You know, are they horses that are being used to just being in a yard, in a paddock, in a stable? Mm. Because if you go confront that horse with something different than it's been experienced before, that's going to be putting a bit mm. more pressure on them. And number three is a big one. Give them time. Oh, yes. Just give yes. them time. And just let them work it out themselves. Yes. Um, so you'll find, I do also say, you know, give them a nice space to move. Lots of horses, when they want to process their environment, will want to move. Mm. Okay, that's why mm. they run around. And you think, oh, they're running around, got to stay them. Don't move, don't move. Yeah. No, let them move because mm. they're moving that stress through their body. They mm. Horses are, are animals of movement and they process and regulate a lot yeah. of them by movement. So give them time. Let them work it but out. But neglect, I say. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Handling. Don't just assume your horse. No, you've got to introduce yourself to the horse and how you do things. Mm. I don't know a number of people that have got themselves in trouble by taking horse and go stick it in cross ties without realising you actually got to teach your horse how right. to do that, mm. how you do things. So you've got to pretend that horse knows nothing. Introduce it to the way you do things. Mm. Um, and routine. Routine is massive. Routine is something that, that can actually hold a horse with f- familiarity. Yeah. It's that, that's powerful. Mm. Knowing what's going to happen, that predictability actually helps create a comfort zone. Which is not unlike us, yeah, is exactly. it? I mean, you know, humans yeah. like that routine. Yeah, I mean, I know definitely. they do process things differently, but it's it's a similar for how we manage our own stress. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the next one is sleep deprivation. Oh, my goodness, I could go on about this because, again, it's insidious and no one understands it. Um, so sleep deprivation occurs... Uh, because horses really need that REM sleep, that cycle of sleep, and they actually only get it when they lay down. Horses can sleep standing up, but they can't get REM unless they lay down. Now, when a horse is deprived of REM sleep, or sometimes they just don't sleep because they, they don't know they're safe, they're not going to sleep if they feel potentially under any threat or they're not sure, they don't feel secure, they won't sleep. And behavioural problems can come out of that, but also... That's extra stress on top of the stress, yeah. okay, which then goes affects the gut and everything, you name it. It's, it's, it's a really insidious um, thing that's out there. So little tips for that is take note of how that horse was, you know, how did they live or at night, how were they, how were they looked after in their old home? Were they stabled? Were they just out in the yard? I remember, um, you know, I did this amazing thing that I thought was amazing many years ago. I thought, oh, my horses are no, not, not have, I shouldn't have them in stables. They should be out in the paddock. So I chucked them all out in the paddock and then I noticed, you know, there were some problems. And what was happening is that they were so, they like going to their stable at night with the fluffy bedding and laying down and going to <laughs> sleep. And where I lived, the ground was a little bit harder. Okay, so that ne- that was a little bit thinking I was doing the right thing mm. and uh, uh, it really changed the routine in their life upside down. So try, if they've been stable before, try to stick with that. And, of course, some people might not have stables. That's fine. Sure. But at yep. least make sure you've got some good bedding for them. Yeah. Okay? And you can always transition out. Like if you don't want to stable your horses that's ultimately, right. but just let them just, have something yeah, whilst, that's consistent. Yeah, whilst they're going yeah. through this changeover period, the transition period, do what you can. I guess they're called creature comforts for a reason, right? That's yeah. right. That's right. It's what they've used to before. Take note of that. And try to at least align with it in some degree. And if you can't, you can't. But yeah. at least make sure they've got somewhere to, to, um, to sleep. Now, it is best to separate them from other horses so they can get introduced from a distance to um, first to begin with. However, to help them sleep, if you've got that lovely, calm horse that knows its way around, you know, 
putting them next to that new horse, to that horse, because as I said, they're used to working together as a team. Horses are herd animals. So that would take a lot of comfort from a horse that's telling them, hey, we're sweet here. No, yeah. it's all good. Yeah. Okay. Um, and of course, the rest of the stress. <laughs> yeah. The rest of the stress we're going to talk about. It's all intertwined. Mm. Okay, so making sure we're dealing with that, you know, establishing those routines and supporting the gut health, et cetera, et cetera. Now, other muscular tension. So you've got a, you've got a stressed horse. It's tense, okay? It's going to be, there's going to hold tension. Um, so let's have a look what we can do about that and acknowledge that. Push that a bit harder. Okay, so there's risk. So you've got a horse that um, you make sure you place them in a space because if they're going to move, let it be a safe space, not mm -hmm. with a whole lot of things going around or a really bad bit of fencing or things like that. So make sure it's a safe space they can move. Um, you know, sometimes if they're shod, putting some bell boots on them beforehand or something like that so they don't go pull their shoes or spin a shoe or something like that. Um, also, so they're going to be hold this tension within them. So if they're, you know, you know, they're liable to pull a muscle or slip over or injure themselves or whatever. So make sure it's a safe place with good footing or things like that. Um, the next one is to, um, for their muscle health, is to make sure your gear fits. You mm. can do the greatest transition ever and be the greatest trainer and rider on the planet, but if your saddle doesn't fit, you're stuffed. Yeah. Okay, and that can cause massive ramifications. Uh, next one is a big one, their feet. Their feet are huge. Um, um, be organised with how is the horse's feet being kept. If they are shod, do something so you know you've arranged your farrier to come, that there's not going to be a period of time where, the, you know, your horse doesn't arrive, it, it's, it needs shoeing, but then you can't, your farrier can't get there for six weeks. Make sure you're organised mm. um, with, their, with their hoof care. Um, because if their hooves get too long or their balance all get thrown out, you're going to risk injury. Um, then just general care when they first arrive. Grooming them is great for their fascia, okay? Stretching them, doing some light body massage. That's all really important because the horse has been in a stressed, tense state. Mm. And it's good for okay. you. It's that bonding yeah, time as absolutely. well. absolutely, yeah. yeah. It lets you get them to know them. Again, it's all yeah. part of forming the routine yeah. and everything like that of how you do things. And, of course, exercise is really important as well. However... Don't go to town. Like, it's, exercise is very, very good for managing stress. It's actually number one thing if you look at humans as well to do with any kind of anxiety or whatever, you know, exercise comes out on top. However, you know, give them some days to, um, you know, to actually settle in. And then when you do start working, I'm an advocate of starting them on the ground, but if you are going to ride them, you're just going to do the most basic foundation responses. Don't get on them and start doing something complicated when they're mm. tense and stressed. Yeah. Okay. Because what you do then, you set yourself up to not only potentially um, injure them, but you could have a fight with them and that's putting your partnership off to a very yeah. crappy start. Yeah. 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 I think that's, again, back to the time that you spoke about before because, you know, you see people proudly telling everyone they bought a new horse and that's exciting. Then you see them that same weekend out competing the horse and I'm thinking yeah. you've had it for three days, yes. you're out competing. I mean, I know that we want to do that ultimately but you're just setting the horse up to fail and yourself to fail. Yeah. Like give them another week, give them two weeks if you can and yeah. – let them adapt to all these things. Yeah, the, the sad thing is for me is that I see people make those mistakes and then, you know, and then they have you, – you have conflict with a horse. You mm. have a fight up front. You're going to have a long time. That horse is going to not perceive you as the, the greatest creature that it it's yeah. comes across. Yeah. And you're going to create baggage with that horse and yeah. then you're going to have to come to someone like me and we're going to have to unpick that. Yeah. And I think, but I don't think people are doing it. I think they just don't understand they don't know. horses. No. And that's yeah. why I said, look, they're, they're herd animals. They're wired, you know, they're wired. Did they process mm. together? So when you remove them from the herd and isolate them and go stick them in a new home, you yeah. turn their lives upside down. Yeah. And I, I don't, so I don't think people do this, um, you know, deliberately or they're being greedy or anything like that. It's purely just, I don't think people understand this aspect of the horse. Yeah. And until really I met that amazing guy, Kerry Thomas, he really put a big highlighter mm. on it. It's mm. like, okay, yeah. this is what's causing the stress. Yeah. So additional stresses, I was saying, is like that's our interactions <laughs> with them um, because, yeah, when we're wrestling with a horse or, you know, um, like 
having an argument with a horse or, or deciding this horse knows nothing. Um, you know, so many people say that. I thought this horse, you know, this horse is meant to be able to do this, but it knows nothing. No, it yeah. just doesn't know how you do it. Yes. So yeah. that's really important. Horses are not robots. We all do things slightly differently and horses get used to their person. And I say it's like you've got to imprint your signature on a horse because mm. everyone is a different height, a different weight. They pick up slightly different. They do things slightly different. And to a horse, they, they're they not used. They don't, they've got to yeah. learn that difference. So it's making sure that everything you do with that horse, you introduce it to the horse and you've got to teach them mm. how to do it. Mm. And that saves a lot of trouble and a lot of stress. Yes, yes. Anyway, hand it over to Ethan now. Thanks, actually. That was amazing. <laughs> so I'll try and work through this quite quickly. I'm conscious that in the audience tonight that there'll be a whole range of horse owners, whether this is your first horse or whether you're an expert horse owner that's trying to learn more. Um, I want to cater to all of that. I think if anyone's listened to me speak before, I have a huge emphasis on the effect of stress in horses. That is central to a lot of the things that I do. But I thought I'd throw to the chat if anyone's interested. I'll give an answer for a minute what I think. But I think it would be interesting to hear what the entire intent, the number one importance to horses is in their life. What do you think that that is? What is everything that they do built around? I just, I'm interested to hear responses as I talk through this. And if you take anything away from this section of the presentation today, it is that a horse's capacity to cope with stress is a finite resource. And so that means that the horse, I would argue that people say that horses hate change and I think they really don't like change. You'll hear people say that, you know, horses are desperate to injure themselves, desperate to get sick. And I would argue that horses are an amazing creature with an amazing ability to survive in the wild. Hmm. And then we've changed everything in less than 1% of their mm. existence. And so the problem is us. And that is that is a good thing in so many ways because it's much easier to change us, us yeah. than it is to change mm. them. Absolutely. And so I will now check the chat and see what everyone answered with because this is really feeds in really nicely. Um, what answers do we got? Companionship. I mean, that's a big part of her dynamics in so many ways that, that – Shelley was talking about. Yeah. It's not the answer I had in my head, but it's definitely important to them. Yep, contentment with peers. So something that comes up all the time, some people say it would be to procreate, and I guess that does make a lot of sense. But to me, the number one thing that a horse seeks to do is survive. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. And horses are very good at detecting change. They're always looking for change. And then I think back to why are they always looking to change, and it's so that they can right. create change. They change in themselves and that's where the vet side comes in and this sort of blend between the behavioural and nutritional side of things is they detect change in the environment and create changes within themselves to cope and that is a finite resource mm. and that hopefully starts to make you think about this horse coming into a new environment with all of these things that Shelley has already spoken about and then they are on the inside that we can't see before we see the behavioural change. Yeah, well, their ability to adapt is, is, can only go so far. Yeah. yeah, exactly right, exactly right. But that poses to us an opportunity to extend their ability to cope with stress, oh, which I'll touch on more yeah. as we go. And I guess this slide addresses that in, in a lot of ways. I want to focus a little bit about on what happens to a horse when they're really stressed. I would love to pick apart the entire stress response in horses but I won't. Uh, I will just touch on when a horse is stressed in the short term, they experience a, a set of changes that can be certainly damaging, but they're generally the signs we associate with typical stress. A horse that's going to get a higher heart rate, uh, they're going to be flightier, they're going to sweat, and horses do this really handy thing where they sweat almost straight salt. So they deplete themselves with salt, which becomes a bit more relevant. We start to look at the causes of acute colitis, acute colic I often say you know adding salt into the diet is basically colic insurance and then we're having a horse suddenly losing a lot of it with sweating stressing uh, they're going to salivate less in response to the adrenaline that's produced that saliva is great for buffering stomach acid but when we don't have it the stomach can get quite acidic and these horses often don't want to eat as well so we're starting to get this mm -hmm. snowball effect mm -hmm. happening of physiological yeah. change but why do they stop salivating why do their pupils change why do they sweat more 
it's a response to the environment to help them to better cope. And it's not until they do it so much that they can't buffer the asset anymore that it becomes a problem. So it is actually a really good thing that they do think these things. It's great, you know, when they if they fence walk to the equivalent in the wild, that's great. As Shelley said, you know, that's that's the canary in the coal mine. Yeah. So it's there for a reason, but it's our job to manage that in a way that's not going to create harm to them acutely in the short term, which we've sort of talked about here a bit. Uh, and we'll often see that, like I said, as, as the behavioural changes. And that can be not only dangerous for the horse, but Linda touched on that as well, really dangerous for the rider. And yeah. what I see as a vet is either someone, I try and avoid pre-purchases, but you'll have colleagues that feel like they failed an owner because they that's not the horse that they saw. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's like, mm. And then you've got yeah. an owner coming to you saying, you know, the horse was drugged, you should have blood tested. And you, you, no, it's, yeah. it's, it happens all the time. And it, it's... I think I, I completely understand it having horses and having sold horses and having bought horses. It's a really stressful process mm. for people. Yeah. Like mm. it definitely, and it brings out the worst in people often. Um, and so we want to see the horse. Well, it's a big investment. It is a it's massive It's a massive investment, investment yeah. not just money, but time. As I said, hopes and dreams. And you go to this process and then you get the horse and it changes. Absolutely. And in the past I've had that happen. You do think, oh, did they lie to me about mm. that horse? Yeah, no. And I look back and think, well, they started cow kicking. They started doing this because they had gut pain, inflammation, stress, all those thing so again if we don't know about it we can't change it yeah what, so, I, what I say to clients that come to me I go you are seeing a stressed version of your horse this is not your horse yeah. this is your stressed this is a stressed version yeah, that's great. of your horse that's struggling yeah the horse that you went and saw that horse that's that that's your yeah. horse yeah. we have to set this horse up to be able to yep. feel yeah that they can be that horse and, and and physiologically and psychologically comfortable. Yeah. I think yeah. when people say it takes 12 months to get a know, to know yeah, a horse, absolutely. It's, there's a component of that is just yeah. the horse being able to be themselves mm. and then you get used to who they are. I've said to home. people before, you don't really even know a horse until they've stood on their own lead rope. That's <laughs> so the amount of people that get knocked in the head by that. And, you, you know, I've got horses that will swing their heads and some yeah. that you don't have to get out of the way for most of the time. But that's, you know, these how many behavioural things that they have, mm. they are so unique. Uh, so I'll move on now a bit more to what we've got this, what we're seeing is this horse that's just arrived on the property, he's fence walking, he's not eating his food. If we allow that to progress and if we don't prepare for that, like Shelley said, they, horses, why do new horse owners have more trouble with horses than experienced horse owners? And it's because horses to the well-trained eye are extremely predictable. They're unpredictable in the sense that they are, they are, how I want to phrase this, they are reliably, unreliably and reliable and predictably unpredictable and you've got to prepare for that and there are ways to prepare for that. So I think we will touch on this a bit further later. The more you can do in the lead up is really the, yeah. the trick. Oh, yeah. But so much you uh, can do. addressing it as soon as you can is really important because once we progress on to the acute, from, from the acute stage to the chronic stage of stress, we get a change in this this cascade of physiology that I desperately want to break down into individual stress hormones, but I will be here all day. <laughs> but I, I'm sure we're all a bit familiar with cortisol being a an ongoing stress hormone. And one thing that I want to stress about stress about cortisol <laughs> is that it's there for a reason. Yeah, it is essential. It has a lot of functions. It has a lot of dysfunctions. <laughs> But ultimately, it is a hormone that changes where energy is used in the body. And I think that's really cool. It pulls energy from certain places and puts it into the places that lead to survival. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, if you do that for long enough, I, you know, if we talk about corticosteroids as drugs, if you people on long-term steroids get lots of joint injections, you're, you're breaking down that tissue with time. And the reason is you are changing how energy is, is partitioned, I guess. And so that's why we'll see horses that get infections when they're chronically stressed. Yeah. Their gut wall won't repair itself at the same rate because we're pulling that energy and going, actually, no, let's protect our organs. Let's stay awake all the yeah. time. And you don't get that. It's like humans. Exactly. It's yeah. exactly yeah. like yeah. that. And, and it's not a great thing to always, the words anthropomorphize and, and talk about humans in relation to horses, but when we talk about the physiological components of stress, they actually are quite similar. Mm. And horses are 
better at making fast change than us, but they aren't aware of the change, so they aren't very good at the And they're not always in control of the change. They're not always in control. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and that's our job as as horse owners. And so we've sort of covered that a little bit already, but when we start to talk about the really bad things that come with it and why we are focusing on this so much and why the physiology is so important is because this progresses a lot over time and we do we do serious damages to our horse and that's not with intent that's the point of education right it's because when we know better we can do better Mm. but i think when we have a little bit of onus on ourselves, it's not a blame game it's a i have the ability to create change both ways yeah and so obviously gastric ulcers are a a hot topic and you know they aren't always a a human induced thing you know that it's more complex than that but there are increased times of risk where things are predictable and there are steps that we can take and it all comes back to acute and chronic stress recognizing the signs before it progresses beyond your control and it is a little bit of a false economy with horses the earlier you can recognize a problem in horses and i now will go to true economy the cheaper it is Mm. the steps that you take with prevention with horse almost invariably Mm. make them a more affordable creature to keep which is, which is cool. So, and that's why, you know, I think how many people have we got here right now? We've got hundreds and hundreds of people online right now who are investing yeah. their time yeah. to be better horse owners, hopefully from this seminar and, and, and continuing education because it truly is an investment because you do get something back. Oh, and I think they give us so much. And that's what I love about these educational webinars that we haven't known and now we do. And so now we can do things differently. And you can change the course of a horse's life by understanding this. You get a new yeah. horse, hasn't worked out, it gets sold on and sold on and sold yeah. on. And it doesn't, and they're only ever seeing the stressed version of that horse. So it's just, it's, it's so cool. Yeah. I'll finish continue. up here and just say if you've seen a horse with Cushing's disease or PPID as it's appropriately called, that is the result of lots of cortisol production and that is what your horse is on the way to when it's chronically stressed yeah and ethan Mm. so cortisol is something that is meant to be acute just a short-term thing to help with fire but unfortunately when stress and stress cascades and all these things compound is that it becomes chronic and it's it's it stops that in and out that it's meant to be Mm. and then there's all this dysfunction can occur yeah Yeah. there's little tonic pulses i guess that keep everything regular but you're so right there is just so much you can do about it when you're aware. Mm. Awareness allows you to be the best guardian for your yep. horse. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to quickly touch on, so what do we do? I want to talk about the physiology all day of what happens, but you're here to learn what can you do with yep. the knowledge that you've got. And I want to be able to give you a toolkit. And obviously there are lots and lots and lots of things, but if I could give you a quick action plan for getting a horse safely from its former home to its new home and in between, I can tell you exactly how I do it. I and know how it works. We know it works because yeah. we've, we've now done run, yeah. what we've got five case studies that we'll briefly, well, four that we'll briefly touch on and one we'll expand a bit more. Yep. Uh, and we've thought down to the, to the tiniest little bit of physiology and what can we change, what is worth changing, where are we going to make the biggest difference because we are going to stress them if we go and get them with 50 things or we sedate them during travel or sedate them for their first ride, sedate them for their first week. People love to sedate things. Wow. Um, But it it happens all the time. And I will need to say that sedation is a brilliant thing for horses when it's used correctly and a horribly dangerous thing when it's not because horses like to make changes to adapt to change. Mm -hmm. And when you sedate them, you are taking that ability away from them. Yeah, you prolong it. So it's, again, perfect preparation. Um, And so... What we will expand on this with Brave's case study, but make the changes that they need in the lead up. And that can start with, if we're talking something you can add in, we talk a lot about our our products because they are brilliant in the digestive EQ and digestive RP and the same with stress based. I'm going to lump them all into this category just for the sake of, of the way that we've been thinking so far is that what all we are doing is increasing the horse's capacity to cope with stress. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing that's going to be hit with that stress is going to be the gut. That's number one. That's number one thing that's, that's the most liable thing to go. Mm. The gut in horses is amazing yeah. in that 
again, I could do a whole webinar on this. <laughs> it's a communication system with the outside yeah. world. When you think about a prebiotic, it's, it's, it's telling the horses what is available around them and it creates really rapid shifts in the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome produces most of the serotonin in the body and then we're going into the, the gut brain axis and we're getting behavioral changes to, to accommodate with the environment. The environment influences the bacteria and the bacteria influence the horse. They're like little puppeteers. And that's pretty sort of on the cutting edge of science, even across the mm. human space, is how big the impact is. I remind people, we didn't know about DNA that long ago. Yes. We couldn't true. see cells that long ago. <laughs> so this, I really believe, is the is new frontier and we need to be the first ones mm. in doing it for our horses because people talk about ulcers from the 70s and say, I wish we knew. Yeah, yeah. There's got to be more of that. Yeah. And this is a great place to start. So if we can extend the horse's capacity to cope with stress with predictable stresses, we know that this is going to happen. We, you say new home syndrome, new horse syndrome to people, they know what we mean, yeah. at least at a base level. Mm. We know that horses can be unpredictable and that's the predictability yeah. of them. Well, in yeah. that transition when they're going to that new home and that, you know, that most stress, it's just putting in those um, things to just buffer. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, mm. Buffer yeah. that transition for yeah. that period of time when you know yeah. they're going to be, at, they're going to be yeah. experiencing the yeah. most Absolutely. kind yeah. of confrontational yeah. change. So, Ethan, back to the travelling, what do you suggest? Well, I think that one further consideration that is important is it's not just moving home. Yes. Especially, okay. and, and this is, this is Shelley's concept, and it's a great one, it, I think particularly if they've moved home before, they may think they're moving again. And so you could just take them to a competition where they're yeah. stabled yeah. and mm -hmm. you will get sometimes the complete yep. full experience of shock. You know, four-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old horses going to their first competition, Yeah, they've never moved home before. They've never been anywhere. You know, it is yeah. extremely stressful. Horses that don't show you their stress, like I, I've been having this conversation this week about going places with the horses and justifying it because – they look like they cope to me, but I know well, I can, know a little bit more. You can yeah. feel them as well when yeah, you ride yeah. them. You can yeah. feel that but time. But even if you don't, I think I think that that is because they can cope so well, those horses. Yeah, because they've been no, – horses that do go out and experience a lot of life and you go out, they – you know, they get – their sensory system gets nurtured for change. Mm. But mm. you're so right. So we're talking about changing home, but going to those competitions, especially those overnight ones or ones that are a few days – the horse is going through this exact same thing. Yeah. 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 So we limit the stress that they're feeling on their body yeah. so that they can cope with that. If their gut's sore or if their microbiome's suffering and then they've got to cope with everything else. Yeah. It's too much. It's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So yeah. if you want an instruction guideline that I'll recommend to you any day of the week, if you do nothing else, a few weeks before, start adding in digestive EQ. I would probably go digestive RP if they're a stressier horse or if they're on a higher grain diet. It's 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 just like a superpower version of digestive EQ, which again is going to give them more stress support. And I'm not, I want to stress, I'm not talking about the behavioral stress so much. I'm talking at this stage, the, the, the lead up, what's changing inside them. Let's help them cope before we see it. Yeah. Uh, and then we've primed them for the move and then we can add in stress paste, which is... Yeah, because the whole transport Solid thing's uh, <laughs> another oh, transport. thing on and top. It, you know, yeah. like my horse has transported plenty. You know, you say things like that. Have they been on a truck? Have they been yeah. on a truck with a pony? Have they been on a truck with a black and white horse? And that sounds crazy, but anyone who's spent enough time around horses know that they do pick weird things like that. Travelling is stressful. Travelling is doesn't stressful. matter how often the horses travel. It is stressful. Yeah, stressful. yeah, yeah. There was a great. Um, uh, there is a world expert vet in in Ireland on travel, and two things that are really important that have come from his research is the most stressful time is actually loading them. They get this enormous cortisol spike, which can lead to laminitis, but that's another thing. It can lead to lots of things, immunosuppression. Yeah. Uh, and four hours of travelling for a horse that's a pretty good traveller is pretty much the energy requirements of four hours of slow walking. Yeah, because they're, co they're completely having yeah. to balance all the time. In fact, I can tell you that one of the first signs of soundness can actually be a horse starting to be difficult to get on the float. Wow. No, yes. that. That, that, it's a big I've got a big, a big correlation. Wow. Yeah, big correlation wow. with that. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. if you correct soundness, I have yep. noticed dramatic improvements. Yep. So it's not to say that all horses that don't float are an No, no, no. But, that's but horses it, adapt. Yeah. Horses, like we said, horses are very good at changing to cope with the environment. Right. 
And if they can't do that, there's something stopping them. Yeah, but if you've got a really good floater that's been good floating or trailing its whole life and suddenly it won't get on, red flag. Red flag. Yeah, Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Uh, So that was when we were leading into stress pace, which is obviously that acute boost of stress because they they have not adapted to cope with domestication. The RP is there to bring them up to basic, you know, we are talking, they just need this to be able to cope better with even being in a paddock because that's stressful for them because they're not used to that. They're used to walking 20 kilometres in a day. Then we put them on a float and that's when we need more advanced care. We need to, you know, they're not drinking. We need to take steps to keep their gut hydrated yeah. so it can do its thing. I want to break down every ingredient but I'd be here all night. But that's that's the science behind it. That's why we do it. We're preparing mm. for predictable. And at the end we share the case study about Brave. I work with an amazing transport company and I'm going to name them because they Go were so that, good. Yeah, Hands Transport. And they were so patient with me as I talked about, because I know all the risks with travelling, and so we'll share what we did. And it was absolutely fabulous. And it just, again, I spoke earlier about what can you control. These are the things we can control. And, and there we were can, things that we couldn't control. And think, that's right. And you've got to work with it sometimes. That's right, exactly. That's exactly. Okay, okay yes. um, I'll jump over. We did. We briefly spoke about sedation, and I am on this mission in my life to educate as many people as I can about the brilliance and the... Oops, and the, back. the threat that omeprazole poses. And for those who don't know what omeprazole is, it's a very commonly used drug that decreases the gut's acid production, which for a horse that has been diagnosed with gastric ulcers from acid production, and we can see that, it is brilliant. It will treat them in most cases. 80%. 80%, and mm. I will say that there is a high recurrence rate. Yeah. But one thing I want to tag onto that is in my clinical experience and across the world, I think that a lot of clinicians will agree that a single dose of this drug is enough to cause squamous gastric ulcers in horses. And that's because of positive and negative feedback systems. So if you suppress the acid production in the gut, it will respond by upregulating. And I'm conscious that I'm sitting across from a pharmacist. <laughs> Can you I say that in more, you're saying upregulating. Can you put that in more simple terms? Upregulating. Okay, so you decrease any a lot of the hormonal function in, in the horse's body. They will then go, ooh, that's low. I'm going to produce more or be more receptive to it. Or So effectively we end up with a slight increase in acid production, but that's okay because omeprazole is on board. And that's why during your 28-day course, they do quite well until we take it away and it goes up. And unfortunately, omeprazole has this dose response that's a bit annoying and it takes a while to leave and takes a while to come in. So usually the body can't adapt very fast to it. So we get this sudden massive production of Mm -hmm. acid and wham, bam, you've got recurrence in up to 80% of horses I've done studies where we've tracked fecal pH. We can see the Mm -hmm. acid rebound. Mm -hmm. And so I say this because it's extremely common for people to give a single dose or, you know, three or four days. And it's actually recommended. It is recommended um, by a lot of vets. And, and, and to be honest, it's, it's progressing, you know, we are progressing towards knowing more and I hear it more and more from, from other vets where we're using things a lot more judiciously, which is exciting for me. Uh, but yeah, this is regularly recommended at overfloating and things like that. So I want to just say, don't not use it at all. Use it under advice from a vet that knows it well. Use it judiciously and be aware of acid rebound. Yeah, That's so, what we call it. So it should be used within its dosage recommendations and not mm-hmm. these one-off kind of doses. Mm-hmm. Which and we've, like, we've had some great cases where we've gone, how do we manage this at the end? And we've asked vets all over the world, some of the best vets clinics, well, what yeah. do you do afterwards? Escape them again in a month, and they and it's oh, that's back on it. that's just Barry. Or you know, I love to talk about Archie. We worked on this beautiful horse who had been on Meprazole for quite some time, and we, we I think we really changed his life. I think we should do a webinar completely on gastric ulcers yes. and Meprazole because that's... we are learning so much. We haven't even spoken about the potential impact of calcium malabsorption using oh, with young horses, it's a the whole pH point. changes. You know, we know that the pH of the stomach just before the food enters into the small intestine drops dramatically. It's almost like that last chance effort to kill anything that shouldn't be going in there. But there's no acid in there. What's the pH now? So it's like, again... We're not saying you don't use it, but it's about hearing from a vet saying use it the way it's meant to be used. 
but we have got alternatives in terms of managing the risk Absolutely. of gastric ulcers, which will... Yeah, well, you want to well and it's a whole, we, we it's a whole, gut, it's a whole <laughs> gut problem. That's yeah, the importance yeah. of it. It's a whole gut problem. One, there's yep. no Band-Aid solution. Yep. And so touching on that, this is a high-risk period where they're not eating, they're not drinking, they are experiencing massive spikes in cortisol and adrenaline. Uh, someone in the comments said they'd love to know more too. I could take the whole <laughs> webinar if you'd like. No, it's definitely, I think, Linda, let's pencil in and yeah. answer the webinar. Yeah. I think it's got to happen mm -hmm. because it's a bit, there's a lot of questions around this mm -hmm. and it's a very big passion point for me. But if I can give you any advice, I love stress pace. I will sometimes top it up every two hours. You get to know your horse with it. It's a very safe thing to give because it's using sort of nature to to to, to have a function. And it's it, not a sedative pace. It's it not a sedative no. pace. Not no. at all. Not at all. No. Your horse will be conscious and and aware and be able to make these changes and have yep. more ingredients able to make changes in their body. And that's what it's for. That's redefining stress if you understand stress then you understand why this is is good but you've got to be able to re, re shift your understanding of stress towards Absolutely. towards the body um and so there it's it's written there you know we want to be traveling them as, as low stress as we can and stress paced a, a classic protocol i'll give a full tube of stress paste the night before yep. full tube of stress paste two hours before we even bring the float in because that's a really stressful time for them and you can give it up to you know I say three tubes a day is a, is a great way to go. Yeah. And you can work with your horse. It's another part of learning learning how, how they respond and some mm. need more, some need less, but it's a great tool to have because in the past, yeah. it was remeprazole, it was sedation. Yeah. I really want to add this in that, that <laughs> I got contacted by. Uh, you, you No, we were talking about this. I'll tell you, Shelley. Okay. <laughs> I got contacted by a brilliant vet at, who said that she had a horse with acute colitis that wouldn't eat and she didn't know what to reach for. She didn't have anything. And she went, okay, I'm going to give you this stress paste and hope to God that, <laughs> that this works. And the horse, like within 10 minutes, started eating. And getting a horse, eating horses, the best thing they can do is eat. Yeah. You change their prognosis massively, yeah. massively. And I found it to be a massive appetite for horses. Mm. A competition, new yeah. home. It's just yeah. very useful and I could talk about that all day. Again, but we would but like to know, if you want to jump in in the poll or, or the comments, let us know if you've used stress paste and what your thoughts are on it because it's not a people sometimes say I oh, used it didn't make a difference but again it's what else are you doing to manage the stress this is about supporting the horse the stresses that we know are happening okay let's keep moving sorry there's just a great comment here okay uh Sharon used stress pace on the weekend and changed from stomping and rocking in the float on the way home to just standing quietly oh Sharon That's we love a that horse that can better cope with the stress that this is exactly and what it we're arrives better about. and then can perform better thank you for sharing no, that with thank us thank you very much for sharing that Okay, we did say we'd get carried away, so we need to keep moving because okay. Nikita's waiting there this patiently. This one is very good. I'm going to skim through this as fast as possible. Let's go to the next slide. We looked at four horses travelling under different circumstances and tried to control this. There was one horse that came from WA. There was one horse that came from the Hunter Valley. There's one horse that came from just down the road, and there was one horse that came New South Wales. Uh, sorry, Victoria to New South Wales, and we did slightly different things when when they moved, and, and it was lucky that these were in our community that we could work with. Uh, we had one horse that had two weeks of priming with digestive RP and stress paste used before, during and after transport. He arrived on the other side. Had, he has had no complications whatsoever, which is great. We had um, another horse that did the exact same thing and he had a history. He's had colic surgery. He came over to this side of Australia actually because he couldn't cope with WA. He needed to be on, on pasture. Um, he... We're now three or so months down the track. He has not had, has not skipped a beat. Then we had a horse come from the Hunter Valley and well, down to Victoria, this one was. Uh, she arrived with a faecal pH of six, under a faecal pH of 6.4. We know that they're sort of digesting their gut. Mm. Uh, she was inappetent. She didn't have anything in the lead up, got stress paced on arrival and continued stress paced. Within a week, we had her up to a fecal pH of 7.1. Within 24 hours, she was eating. And I've got this mm. with video recording. And horse number four got no stress pace or RP prior to travel. He only came 70 kilometres, which is a competition. You know, that's that's not far. Mm. Only came 70 kilometres, didn't get RP, RP or stress pace on arrival. After a week, we wanted to see how he would go. Because that's it sort of seems like cruel that you're withholding it. And I love if anyone's thinking it's cruel, why didn't you give it to them? That's, oh, there, sorry. <laughs> that's great. You're exactly right. We can do something, so we should. But in this case, yeah. it was a normal setting where you don't yeah. do that. The horse was terrible for a week. He looked like a three-year-old, but he was six. He, he, It was just hard to watch. So we went a week in. We started in with stress paste. 
he took a while, like he started to eat quite quickly, but to get back to normal, we're months down the track now. And if, you, if I lined these horses up and asked you to pick them, I think the first two would be almost impossible to pick. You might get close with three, but you would pick four if you were, had one eye. You know, it, it was really obvious. I just think that that's so profound. Yeah. And it's, it, it, take it for what it is. But if, yeah, like I said, if, if you're looking at that thinking, oh my God, the poor last horse, I wish that he had RP and stress paste. Yeah. It's awesome. It's fantastic. It's just another tool in the toolbox. It is. It's another tool. It is. And now I'll pass over to Nikita, who's joining us live from Queensland. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you, Shelley. Um, I think it's, what has been discussed already is amazing in terms of laying the foundation um, for stress for all of the impacts um, that move, uh, moving a horse can have. Um, what I'll try and do today is just really focus on a lot of the practical tips around what we can do to make sure that we have an effective diet transition, which I might be a little bit biased, but I think... Um, it's probably one of the most overlooked parts, I think, when um, horse owners are buying a new horse. Um, I've had countless conversations with clients over the years um, that haven't actually talked to the to the old owner about the existing diet. Sometimes they might have an idea about hard feeds and things like that, but often not about haze and about feeding management. So I think um, often, it, yeah, it does get a little bit overlooked. And then I think we see the result of that um, kind of weeks and months down the track. And then I think um, Ethan and Shelley both talked about the fact that, and I think Linda as well, that often we can end up with like a fire breathing dragon horse that didn't, wasn't the horse that we thought we were getting. Um, and often the gut has a role to play here as well in the, in the diet. So I just, um, I think I'm a little bit biased being a nutritionist, but I think it's so important that we get this right. So first of all, there are a few things that a diet change can um, have an impact on with regards to our horse. Um, and a lot of that comes down to fundamentally things like not eating. So a horse might stop eating. And so we might, it might not be primarily a diet problem, but it might be a stress issue or a physiological issue or a pain issue that's causing them to stop eating. And then all of a sudden we start to get this cascade of events that happen as a result. Um, the other, the other big one is probably around diet change. Um, and you think about it, we're, we're shifting horses around all the time and we've talked about it quite a lot tonight and the impact that that has on a horse um, and I, when I'm moving horses and thinking about moving horses, I'm thinking about, okay, what do the pastures look like? Um, what species do we have? What, um, what hays have we got available? Are the feeds that are available even the same, um, depending on whereabouts we're moving the horse to and from? So, um, from a diet perspective, I think those are two really key important elements. Um, and then obviously, oh, you've you've skipped me already. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, I was just going to say. So the flow on effect to that is what we see as as horse owners. We see the we see the behavioural changes. We see the pain associated with gastric ulcers. All of a sudden, that horse starts to get girthy. Um, they start to perform maybe a little bit worse or, or differently to what we we're expecting. Um, and so this over time. Um, combined with what's going on internally um, leads to a lot of these chronic problems um, that we see. And then we kind of, as horse owners, it can be quite disheartening because we, you know, often when we're, we're getting a new horse, it's a really exciting time. And um, then when that doesn't go so well, um, it can, it can be a bit disheartening for us. So sorry, you can skip to the next slide, slide Linda. So, I guess what are some of the things that we want to um, 
ensure that we know about the diet of the new horse. And some of these things we, we want to know before we actually get them. And planning, I, th I think um, everyone has touched on it tonight, but planning is actually really important. Um, and that's the same with diet. So uh, we need to know, obviously, what hard feeds are being fed currently by the old owner. It's really important to know weights of feeds in any situation, but especially when we're moving that horse and, and taking them to a new property, because we want to make sure that we have as smooth a transition as possible. And one of the ways that we can do that is by mimicking their old diet for a while. So ensuring that we have accurate information around hard feeds and supplements is really important. Um, not only that, uh, the hays and the conserved forages that the horse is getting currently. And um, a little tip that I like to get my clients to do is if they can, and if it's practically possible, potentially purchasing some of the, the old owner's hay or whatever forages they were using because we can't take the pasture with us, we can't take the paddocks. Um, but if we can use some of their hays, then what we're doing is we're minimising um, that initial kind of abrupt change to the gut. Um, and, and consider things about, um, for example, grass time out at pasture. So how much time did the horse have out at pasture when it was with its old owner? And if we're going to change that, then we've got to make a plan around what that looks like for our horse. And if we are going to, if we do plan on changing their diet quite drastically, then and that sometimes can be a good thing. Sometimes we want to change their diet. Um, then even working with the previous owner before that horse moves and then throughout that journey, um, bringing some of our feeds even in at that point can be really useful. So um, just really thinking about, yeah, trying to make that transition as smooth as possible. We can slip to the next slide. Uh, right. Oh, sorry. Did we go back? Ah, oh, sorry. So some of the ways that we can do that, and I've touched on this already, so I'll try and be um, as quick as I can because I'm mindful of time as well, but really planning for that change for your horse. So keeping in mind that your pasture is going to be different to your neighbour's pasture, even the, the pastures within a property can differ quite significantly. Um, and I probably test more pastures than, than most. And um, often if I'm testing on a big property, I might look at different parts of that property um, for different reasons. And even within the same property, uh, there can be significant differences between the, the pasture and the nutrients that are in there. Um, and then keeping in mind that the horse's gut will take a while to adapt to any new diet. So the bugs in the in the horse's gut, they're, they're really cool, but they're quite diet specific. So they can take at least kind of three days to start to adapt to any sort of diet change. So it's really important that we work with the bugs in the gut and think about them when we're, um, when we're looking at an effective diet transition. And, and don't kind of expect too much from your horse, um, from your new horse. In the first, at least, I would say, two to three weeks. Um, you don't want to be kind of getting a new horse and then taking it out competing the next week because um, they're going to be in that real transition period and their gut especially needs time to adapt to change. They need time to start to digest the feeds that you're putting in, um, especially if your pastures are really different from where they've come from. That's going to take some time. So just be patient with them. I think that's been mentioned a lot tonight. But really from even an energy production point of view, um, while they're adapting to that change, they can't actually often produce energy. And when they're dealing with stress, energy is getting redirected to other places as well. So again, that horse, um, you know, it might not be feeling that great for that first at least kind of two to three weeks. Um, and it's a really good idea to actually capture um, any common issues that that horse might have had in the past as well. So history of colic, you know, ob obviously things like laminitis, metabolic issues are really important as well. Um, but keep in mind that in this initial period, these are some things that you might experience, you know, things like mild colics and, and things with 
with uh, changes in pasture and hay and hard feed. Um, next slide. Sorry, I've just lost my screen a little bit. There it is. Um, so this really just summarizes, I think, what we've been talking about. So um, the first step would be really to look at the prior feed and then look to gradually change this feed over a period of at least 14 days. Um, and that's really going to give your horse the best chance to um, to transition successfully over to their new diet that you're wanting to feed them. And it's okay to want to change a horse's diet. Um, and we're going to give you some practical steps on how you can do that with the likes of Feed Assist and um, some guidance around that. Um, but just know that you, you do need to do it and probably more so than if you're just doing it with your horse that's been on your property for a long time, you need to do it probably even more gradually because they're undergoing, um, like the others have mentioned, all these other stresses at the same time. We don't want to load a whole bunch of stress on their gut too. Um, using things like stress pace is actually a real godsend and um, I've, I've seen this so many times now, when, especially when horses will actually stop eating. So a common symptom for horses when they're stressed or when they're not happy is they'll, they'll stop eating, they'll lose their appetite, they'll stop drinking, and then we kind of just, it's a snowball effect. Um, so using stress pace from a protective, um, a gut protective point of view can be a really good way to minimize or, or reduce the risk of that horse actually stopping eating um, and it's really effective when it's done throughout the transit and then uh, before the transit throughout and then immediately on arrival and it's it's a it's always important um, I, I probably say this all day if I could that horses always have access um, to forage all the time and whether this be um, during their during their journey or um, soon after, we never want to withhold a forage from our horse or um, clean fresh water. And we had a question in the chat earlier, and somebody asked about um, the benefits of a slow feeder versus the risk of choke. And choke something that we um, it seems to be more of a I think a New Zealand and an Australian issue in terms of. Uh, in some ways, I think it's a bit of a horse owner issue. I would love to see all horses traveling with forage if possible. Um, but if that's not possible or you are concerned, um, then you can make regular stops. So as long as that horse isn't going kind of more than two hours um, without access to forage, it just means that your trip's gonna take a bit longer if you're having to stop a lot more if they're not being able to eat constantly. Um, and then further gut support on an ongoing basis is really going to be useful. And we talk about digestive EQ here. Um, and Ethan mentioned as well that RP can be really useful for our very stressy horses. And I think RP, another you know, place that it might have is for times of increased stress. So when we're when we're talking about moving horses, um, could be one of those those times that it might be useful as well. Nikita, we do have um, a fair few people joining us from the US in, in the chat. Excellent. Uh, which is really great. And I just wanted to touch base with them and let them know that when we say digestive RP, the equivalent in the States is digestive HP for high performance, but it, it's much the same. And it was exactly the same. Exactly well, the same and we, we are about to rename it in Australia. So yes. it's consistent. So everyone, yes. it will be HP everywhere, high performance. The more stress the horse has, the more gut support they need. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you do, you do see the gradual rollout of the name change, everyone yes. listening, they are the same to save the confusion. Sorry. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So if we move along to... Um, so this little graphic is something um, that if you use the, for example, the Poseidon's Feed Assist program, um, that it will just kind of help you give the foundation really of, of how to transition. And so if we look at the, the red or the orange kind of color here as our current diet, then basically in the first few days, we want to look at replacing only maybe a quarter of that diet with the new diet. So the new diet being the greeny kind of 
is it turquoisey color um and then days four to seven we can increase that again by another 25 percent days eight to 11 increase it again and so on and so forth until we get out to that day 12 to 14 and and if we actually just follow this simple kind of methodology, then uh, we shouldn't have too many problems when we're transitioning diets, as long as we're transitioning to good, you know, good diet ingredients and, you know, not going from, you know, a great diet to then all of a sudden feeding a whole bunch of raw grain. We don't want to do things like that. But if, if we use this as a guide, it can be really useful. So I just wanted to touch really briefly on um, we use we use Feed Excel a lot, and one of the um, brilliant things that Feed Excel will do is you can actually input your pasture or your forage analysis in there, and um, it will show you what your diet looks like and then how you need to balance that. So then if we look here, um, I've actually chucked a couple of just real life pastures. Um, in here and we can see that although a lot there are a lot of similarities um there are some differences so for example um in environment one we've possibly got a selenium deficiency and we need to top that up in environment two in the pasture and these are just pasture only diets um in environment two we'd have no issue there um, and you can see even with some of the other trace elements, there are some differences in terms of what might be required. So it's kind of different strokes for different folks or different, um, you know, depending on where your horse is going, where they've come from, they might need a slightly different approach. So just keep this in mind, um, especially when you're taking your horse from one property to another. And I think it's something that's often overlooked. And we talked before about the journey and the importance of that. A lot of um, transporters, um, I'm sure this happens all around the world, um, will have depots where they'll stop off as well. And they'll often have little um, turnout paddocks and things that horses can go to. So you imagine if we've got all these different pastures that the horse is even having to deal with on its journey. And then when it gets to its new home, it's, it's put out into a paddock. And forage or, or pasture will often make up a significant portion of that horse's diet then there's a significant change there too. So some of the ways that we can help a horse kind of cope with that is by, um, in those initial stages, perhaps diluting out the pasture, I call it. So um, using some of our forages and some of our other feeds with no nutrient content um, to dilute the effect of that pasture change. So effectively, what I mean by that is just feeding more of, of your feeds um, over that transition period than, than the pasture so that they're not um, having that sudden change from one pasture source to another. So if we have a look here, this is um, this is a neat um, program that Poseidon actually have um, within their website. And I'm just gonna make this bigger so I can see. It's free, um, so it means everyone should be guessing. Yeah, so effectively what, what you can do is you can put all of your horse's details in here, put what work they're in, um, what breed they are, um, basically all of the details around your horse that we need to build a diet, what your goals are for that horse. So do you want them to maintain weight? Do they have ulcers, laminitis, things like that? And then it will ask you some questions around what what's in your pasture um, and it kind of guides you so um, gives you a bit of an idea if you if you don't and there's a few prompts there which are really useful as well you can put in a lot of your forages which is actually really cool because um, what feed assist will do is it will actually encourage fiber diversity and help you help ensure that you've got enough fiber diversity in your horse's diet too, which will really help them cope in this transition period. Sorry, I'm racing through here. And then, um, and then it will bring up basically some recommendations for you. Um, it will tell you where you're falling short or uh, in this situation, um, it will balance it for you. And then it will send you a comprehensive report of all of that. So that was just a really kind of quick one minute um, into feed assist. Um, but I encourage you all to kind of jump online 
give it a go um and especially if you are looking at getting a new horse it can be a really good place to start if you're not quite sure how to manage that transition we've had a few um questions in the chat tonight around um using and in, including hp eq things like that in the diet and this will really help you in that transition period Okay, that is only at one and a half times speed and I came, that's actually me making one for a real horse. I knew the weights of the things that I was already feeding and that's only one and a half times speed so that's how easy it is. Like Linda said, we, it's free, it's fast, it's accurate, it's safe. And it's just been improved. Yeah. We've had this program for a few years but Nikita and Ethan have been working very close with Feed Excel. So to, as we've learnt more, we wanted to encourage more fibre diversity because in the past this program wouldn't let you add extra things like beet fibre if you'd already met your digestible energy requirements. So we've we've actually improved it so it's got all the latest, I guess, learnings around diet and nutrition and it's actually really exciting. So Nikita's done a brilliant job and working with this. Really well, actually, yes. so the cool thing about it too is that it will um, give you customised advice for your horse's specific situation. So if you select my horse has ulcers, you select my horse has laminitis, it will give you some good feeding tips around that too, which I think is really useful. Fabulous. Thank you, Nikita. I think we're heading hey, back over back to Shelley. I'm just noticing the time, so we'll just yeah, keep moving through. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do this quick. So creating a partnership. So when I ask people what they, you know, what would they like to achieve with their horse? A very common thing is they say, oh, look, I just really want a good relationship with a horse. That's what they say. And look, that's really lovely, but you actually, your relationship comes from the quality of the partnership you establish with the horse because relationships need a focus to be able to create it from that create experiences and then those experiences equal the quality of your relationship. So um, those additional stresses that we talked about at the start, um, how we get on with the horse can be a major source of stress. So being proactive about that, okay? So it's making sure that you um, introduce yourself to the horse, you introduce how they're handled, and I advocate, I'm just going quick here, um, I actually advocate being d doing a focused effort when you get a new horse or even if you've had a horse that you haven't got on with set your site self aside four to six weeks not much out of your life to actually what I call rebuild or rebuild the foundation and every single horse should even if you've got a Grand Prix dressage horse it should still have its foundation on there and it should be able to do it as well it's like having a concert pianist they can still do their scales mm -hmm. okay but it's really good to come back to that and introduce yourself at that level um, look, I recommend starting on the ground and building into the saddle. That's what I advocate because it's a really good place to get to know a horse is working um, up like that and also helps for that transition for the person as well. And this is kind of thing what I do and what I advocate. I do actually recommend if you've got access to a round yard is to start at liberty with the horse and actually work with it with nothing. Just introduce yourself in that way. Then on to groundwork and then on to the foundation riding that I talk about. Um, and, and that's what I work on. That's a good part of my career is what I do is helping people do that four to six week period and kickstart their relationship or fix it up um, so they can get out there in the world and enjoy their horse. Shelley, I know you have lots of amazing clinics. So if people want to learn more about your clinics or attend your clinics, they can go to your website? Yeah, they can go to my website. Also, I do work with people all over the world through my um, online programs, which are very effective. And I have the most beautiful membership community you know, like I've got a great community that you can talk, that we can have conversations and people are barefoot, whatever, they're really into barefoot or they're very conscious about wearing, like people of all diversities and we have beautiful conversations. We absolutely yeah. respectful, but it's a very safe place and people are really committed to being really good guardians of their horse and creating really mm. good relationship and partnership with them. So that's my... Membership Society, which you can all find out about my clinics and my stuff from my website. I, I know how respected you are. People speak so highly and I know people have been to your clinic and I know how helpful you've been with our yeah. horses. So I really would encourage people that have joined the webinar to jump on, get in touch with Shelley and learn as much as you can from her. Thank you. Anyway, I'll send it over to you. 
Back to you, I think. <laughs> oh, gosh, that was very quick. That was, okay. that was okay. very, yeah. Caught up for okay. you. Hey. <laughs> um, so we're going to finish with a case study, and I am very excited to say this case study is on my horse. And Ethan um, helped me find this amazing horse. He's called Braveheart, and he has actually come in a really special time in my life. So I'm very excited to have him. And we just want to share, I just want to very quickly share how we um, have taken all these tips that we've shared today and actually applied them. So that was me the day that I met Brave. You can see I was taking my time to get to know him. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this horse was like, Brave, you come live with me, you're getting a lot of love. Now, I was very fortunate. This horse had had an amazing start, an amazing foundation. So I'm really, you know, that made it really easy for me. But also in terms of the communication that I had with the previous owner, which I'll share, it just meant the transition was fabulous. But doesn't matter how settled a horse is in its previous home, I was still very aware that there was a very stressful event about to take place with Brave. So I'm just going to really start at the very first point. And we're not going to the whole pre-purchase and all those things, but just to say I did actually take my time to find this horse and it was lucky that I had some great mentors helping me and, and guests helping me calm my farm and just go, Linda, we'll find the right horse for you. So I had an independent assessment. I actually think that was a really great idea, someone that you trust that can go and see the horse and just make an assessment because otherwise, you know, you fall in love with the horse very easy. So it was good to have someone kind of screen the first time and then obviously do a thorough vet check. That was really important. So then we moved on to the next stage. And what I did really well with Brave was take all this knowledge of stress and risk factors of transitioning a horse and going, I'm going to put everything I understand to practice. And I will just say too that we've taken all these ideas and created some um, downloads on our website so that if you're preparing and you need to know, as Nikita said, what was the horse being fed? Is there a history of colic, et cetera, et cetera? Everything you need to know, there's a form that you can send to the previous owner for them to fill it out. I and think that was something that when, when we went through with Brave, it was like, I don't want to forget anything because, you know, I didn't ask about the worming. I didn't yeah. ask about what shoes he wears. And so that's what we've tried to do is put something together. Well, I did, but it was like five different messages a day. Now, yes. Lee, you know, can yes. you tell me this? Can you tell <laughs> me that? So literally there are a few things that we did that was very significant. I made sure that he would arrive at a time that I would be home and that it wasn't, I mean, I do... Obviously, with Poseidon, I do have people help me with the horses, but I wanted him to form a bond with me. So I knew I was going to a conference. We made sure that Brave was coming at the right time. His previous owner, Lee, was so um, accepting of all these questions that I had and, and all these kind of, would it be okay if we did this? So I sent down some RP and stress pace to Brave about four weeks, I think, before he came. So I knew he had that gut support happening before he arrived. And then, you know, I got a copy of the diet, I got the history and started to look at the transition because Brave came to an area, I live on the south coast and the and the grass is very high oxalate. So there were different dietary needs. So it wasn't about saying his whole diet wasn't good enough. It was about going, I've got to get a diet that suits him in this new environment. So we did that. So I had a plan and also it'll come up in a moment, but we actually, oh no, it's on there that... Lee made some feeds up. So when he went with the transport people, they gave him his feed. So we could make those transitions. I wasn't able to buy lots of his hay that he was used to because he was coming from Victoria to New South Wales. But what I did was then manage the stresses that I could do. So I then got the history of everything around, you know, when was he deworm? When was his feet last done? When were his teeth done? But again, it was lots of constant messages and she was very patient with me. But now we've put it into a checklist of action, what you do four weeks, two weeks, the day the horse arrives, etc., and then a form that you can send to the previous owners. So it's all there. And I actually think you could do that when you're sending a horse away to be started under saddle or if a horse is going away to training. Give them as much information as you can. The transport side of things, I was very fortunate. I mentioned that I worked with the transport company, um, Hands Transport. They, again, they were very patient with me because when you know the impact of stress, I knew that he would have, you know, it's all new. There'd be new hay, there'd be new horses on the truck, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually gave them a strategic plan about when he would get stress paced. The night before, when he landed, that afternoon, and then I drove and picked him up at a um, contact that point. I drove two hours to make sure that he had <laughs> extra stress pace and watched him go on to the truck. Yes. It was, it's precious, precious yes. cargo. Yes. 
And, you know, he had a slow hay net with hay travelling back to Wollongong. And then when he arrived, I made sure that he was in a paddock next to another horse and just monitored him and did everything that you would normally do, like taking temp, monitoring, checking, is he eating, is he drinking, all those things. Was he fence walking? I have to say, this horse, his transition was has been so smooth, but I was planning ahead all the time. And then I actually spent hours and hours on feed Excel going, mm-hmm. here's the diet that he was on. We can now do it, I think, on feed assist. Can we? Is that Okay, so that's in coming this soon. case, you, could have, you don't necessarily need to, at that stage, know what he's come off. The fibre types are amazing to know, but you can just plug him in and see a new diet for him, being mindful of what's he's been fed on been fed that's where you start your transition this is what we're going to it's that easy it'll just spit you out a diet that doesn't have you know uh you know you have to be all of the feed has to be this brand unless you choose to you can choose to have a specific brand that you feed if that's if it is really meant to be for everyone gotta try and make it easy i mean literally it was week one he's having this week two week three and slowly adding in diversity of fiber and different things so it was all about the planning managing the travel he arrived everything was great so then in terms of the next Next one, please, Ethan. Mm. I'm moving through this quickly because we have covered this, but what I'm saying is I actually used all the strategies we've spoken about and applied them. So then that is him there. Shelley spoke about just spending time with your horse. Brave and I go on walks all the time. You know, we go exploring. We, you know, I'm actually getting fit. It's great. I'm, I'm walking on the property. We go exploring in the creek. We just spend time together. But I just made sure that gut transition was really well. And you can see by the shine of his coat, I think that's week two, he was just blooming because he was, we did everything. We had a great foundation to start with, but then I managed the changes in the stress. And it was that constant monitoring. I was looking at, has his manure changed? Day five, I walked out and he was lying flat out in the paddock. I thought, oh no, he's got trouble sickness. I was just panicking and I ran it, brave, brave. And he looks, he puts his head up, huh? <laughs> he was sleeping. And that made me Perfect. feel very happy that he was already so chilled out. But it was literally just spending time with him, understanding you get a new job, right? You go to school, you change houses, it's stressful. You've got to take time. Same for him. I was very conscious that I was a new owner for him. He didn't know me. I didn't know him, but it's just been that time with him. And, you know, we just, it's been a very slow process with him. But by thinking about previous horses that I've owned and I didn't do this, it was a very different experience. I do remember one horse used to kick out every time in a transition. I remember ringing the previous owner and going, why didn't you tell me that he did this? He goes, well, he hadn't done it before. Because I now know it was gut stress. And interestingly, it was on the right-hand side where there would have been sequel pain. So yeah, the yeah, outcome... The whole webinar yes. itself. <laughs> um, so the outcome is, besides the fact that Braveheart has changed my life and I adore this horse, the transition's been great for him. And how do I know? Because his weight has been wonderful. His coat's shiny. He's calm. He's happy. He's eating. He's drinking. He's sleeping. His manure's consistent. There's been no fence walking. He's even, when the other horse leaves, I still have him on his own. I've had him for about four weeks because he... Um, yeah, I'm just trying to find the right horse to put him with, but he doesn't get stressed. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that, that I, like we've had a unique situation where I've seen the horse on both sides yeah. of transport, of old home and new home, and you know I've seen plenty of those that that happen, and I've seen different horse on the other side, and the consistency is it speaks for itself. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same horse on both sides. Yeah, it's the planning, it's the preparation, it's all the things we spoke about getting the diet, the old diet, making the transition, doing everything that Shelley said. I understand that I could do that. Sometimes we can't control everything. We do the best we can. If you only have stables and your horses come from a paddock to a stable, that's tricky. But what you can do is support the horse through, right. you know, all the other things that we spoke about. So it's been the most amazing, yeah, the most amazing process. And I am so grateful for the knowledge that I have now to make this transition better for Brave. Mm. And for me, I am just, you know, I'm 57, haven't had my own horse for a long time. And I was joking earlier saying I did a talk recently to some high level dressage riders and they asked me, what do I plan to do with Brave? And I said, well, I'll brush him. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I brush him, I walk him, I do ride him. But the most important thing is that I wanted him to be safe. He's only a young horse. And so far, everything we've done you know, there's also the other side of things, getting a saddle, you know, getting the, his T3 done again and just all that stuff that you would do anyway. But just being mindful, his whole world has changed. That's right. And if I can make it great for him, 
then it's great for me. Yeah, so it's good. You've got you've got brave and not stress brave. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. And I plan yeah. to do some clinics with Shelley next and, year. Brave and not coward. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So and you can see that photo there of, of yeah. Brave and I hanging out. Um, I'm hardly ever inside anymore. I'm just down. I think Brave sees me and goes, "Oh, she's uh, here I again." Think as well, <laughs> from 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 a friend's perspective as well. It's very obvious. I mean, it'll be obvious to you as well, but we can see how much horses impact our lives. Yes. And you touched on it. It's been a, a, there's been a lot of stress for you at the moment, and it's lovely yep. to see how a horse that's been he, – he's not had to be a stress for you on, on the other end, so that makes it easier for you. you yes. Know? And we're, it's okay to think about things like that. Why do we have horses to add to our life? We want to add to their life as yes, much as we can. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I'm seeing. Yep. Yeah, and what you've done is very practical, strategic things that have – and, and kind of with awareness, yeah, yeah. yeah, knowing what you've got to do. Yeah, yeah. yep. Cool. This has been the most amazing webinar. Like we've already, like that's an hour and a half and there's still so much that we could cover. But Shelley, thank you so Sorry, much for joining us. And Nikita, I think you're about to call, uh, read out the winner of the prize. But before we do that, thank you, Ethan. It's, you know, a Poseidon. We are so grateful to have amazing people that join us and work with us. And we pride ourselves. We feel that we are different to other companies because it is really if you want to get the best out of your horse, it's the management, which comes into diet, all those things, education, and supplements do have a role to play, but they're not the first thing that we talk about. We have to educate. We have to do things better. We owe it to our horses, and then they give us so much in return, and I, it's good for me to be experiencing that again because they do change our lives, and we change their lives. So let's try and change it for the better. So thank you, amazing team. And Nikita, can I please ask you to read out the winner? Absolutely. So the winner of the amazing prize pack is Lara Hewitt. Okay, Lara. So yeah, we will, yeah, congratulations. What an amazing prize that you have. We will obviously have your details. Please reach out to us. And I just want to do a big shout out to to the team at Poseidon. They particularly to Harry because he has joined the team recently and he put together this presentation and he has been phenomenal. But yeah, we have a, we have such a great team for side. It's a it's a privilege to work there. So we can go to the thank you slide. Finish up. Um, does anyone do you any of you want to say anything else before we finish up? No, oh, I'll do a shout out yeah. to to the, the team behind the scenes <laughs> because they have to deal with getting this to there, <laughs> and that's not easy. Uh, it's not easy, and I. Love and appreciate the team. It's amazing to work. Oh, and I've been very grateful to be involved in the process and seeing how something like that gets all put together <laughs> by a big team. So thank yeah, you. yeah, and um, and and even the technology work. So thank you to Wade here and. <laughs> yes. But and everyone for joining us and staying with us, we have gone, you know, right on time. So we thank you for that. And now you're on our mailing list. You'll hear about you know upcoming webinars. And thank you again for joining. And we really keen to hear from you what you actually learnt tonight. So if you're not in a hurry to leave, jump in on the comments and just tell us, was there one takeaway thing that you got from tonight or one thing that surprised you or something new that you will do differently? Someone's but just thank asked you. if we have recorded this, this has been recorded and we'll be distributed. Oh, yes, of course. I normally say that and we'll, yeah, distribute that and we'll also send the answers to any questions that you have. If you get home and you lie in bed awake thinking, oh, I should have really asked that question, send it through. We have, you know, a great team all the time and we never stop learning. And that's the joy of it all. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much, everyone.